You take that simple statement, God is love, and realize that to truly understand love, you've got to start with him. Amen? Uh, God embodies love. He displays unconditional love. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad for the love of God today. Amen? Amen. February is often the time we think of love, and uh, you might have already been to the store and seen the aisles and aisles and aisles of um, love items, like hearts and balloons and candies and flowers. I am really loud. I don't know who adjusted my mic, but I know you didn't, Pam, but I'm going to help you adjust it back. It says uh, headset, AT, something wireless mic. Can you just pull that slider down a couple notches, uh, up just a little bit from where, halfway, perfect, right there. Can you guys hear me all right? I feel like if I moved there for a second, I would start ringing and feeding back, and that's not good. But um, thanks, Pam. Appreciate that. She's a versatile lady up there, filling in all sorts of spots today. Um, you know, you, you can look at these items in the store, and, and really, how much do they show love? I mean... A balloon or a box of chocolates, does it really display love? I know there's all this science behind chocolate and what it does to your brain and the endorphins or whatever they are released and make you have that sensation. So maybe chocolate is the food of love. But really, if we're going to understand love, it's more than just an item or, or, or a, a balloon or a gift, right? Love <clears throat> is, is a whole lot deeper than that. And so over the next few weeks, I'd like to look at a biblical perspective of love and hope that as we are inundated or flooded with uh, all this uh, imagery of what the world says is love, that we would truly understand God's love. And if you look in your word, probably the most famous scripture that you think of God's love is probably one of the most famous verses in the Bible, right? John 3.16, I'm going to read 3, 16, 17, and 18 today. It says this, For this is the way God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And we normally stop there, but look what John writes in seven, verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the, the world should be saved through him. Then verse 18, The one who believes in him is not condemned, the one who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. You see, a lot of people might want to hold up a sign that says John 3.16 and then preach all this really angry condemnation on people. And if they read John 3.16, and 18, verse 17 says Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn us, right? Jesus didn't come to send us to hell. Jesus came to save us. Now, conviction is important, right? But conviction and condemnation are two different things. Conviction works in us to say that you're doing something wrong and you feel convicted about it and that conviction should lead you to make it right. Whereas condemnation says you've done wrong and you'll now be punished for that wrong. Right? Everyone see the difference there between conviction and condemnation? The Holy Spirit works great conviction in us to bring us to a point of repentance and turning to God. Condemnation says, I have no hope. Jesus didn't come to not give you hope. Jesus came to give you the greatest hope, the hope of eternal life, the hope that says the worries and cares and concern and sickness of this world is soon to pass away and we'll have perfect fullness of life with God forever. You see, we live in a world where people mock this verse. You know, they, they put 316 on something, and it's usually to make a mockery. They might put their name on it like a wrestler, put 316 after it, and I don't know what they think they're the savior or whatever of the wrestling world. You know, you see a movie, and they might mock, have a mockery of this foolish person holding up John 316 in the stands, and something stupid usually happens to him. We live in a world that makes a mockery of God's love. But why does that happen? Why are people so ready to make a mockery? A friend of mine posted on Facebook, what Bible verse does it say you shouldn't vaccinate your, your kids? And someone, I was reading the comments on it, and 
someone immediately put the spaghetti monster in the sky told me not to believe in a fictional book because there's a a a little group of people in our world that rather than admitting there is a god choose to believe that there's a spaghetti monster in the sky because in their world the spaghetti monster in the sky makes as much sense as a divine being creating and controlling everything around us and i thought how quickly you know you can say well some people have different opinions respect each other's opinions and live your life right but rather than doing that these people want to make a mockery of god why do they do that because john tells us right here that they're already condemned because they've chosen to deny christ right the one who believes in him is not condemned if you believe in jesus you don't have that condemnation but the one who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. You see, even at Jesus' moment of sacrifice, of paying the price for our sin and fulfilling John 3.16 on the cross, we're told that he was put up with some common thieves, some, some, some people that were being um, crucified for their own actions. And all around Jesus were people on the ground, and even these two on the cross next to him were mocking him. They, they, were, they were just saying all sorts of things. Well, if you're really the Messiah, come down off of that cross. Save yourself and us. Right? They're having these moments of mocking Jesus at the, apparently the lowest point in his life. And, and his ministry seems to have been worth nothing at this point in human eyes. But then one of these thieves has a moment of clarity. and says, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And what's Jesus' response to this once mocker now? repentant man he says today you will be with me in paradise you see this man lived 99 percent of his life in mockery and in the 11th hour in the final moment he had a moment of clarity that said i am undone by myself i need a savior jesus will you remember me when you come into your kingdom and in that moment of repentance John 3.16 fulfilled, that man is guaranteed the promise of eternity. Today you will be with me in paradise. You see, the mocker has been condemned already because he's chosen to deny Christ. But when we have the moment of clarity in our lives and realize our need for a Savior, God responds. No longer condemned, but given the promise of eternal life. You see, mockery is a, is a trait of condemned men. That's, that's how they live their life. They want to mock everything because they don't see value in anything. You know, many of us have probably heard uh, in our life, if you've been in church any amount of time, you've probably heard a number of messages on John 3.16. You've probably heard it presented a number of different times. And this morning, I want to do something a little bit different. This morning, I have a video that we're going to load, and Pam's going to be good to go here in just a second. Hit the space bar, and we're going to load it. Here it comes. This is a more modern play on the story of John 3.16. So if you would, for the next about 18 minutes, turn your attention to the screen and follow along. Renata, go ahead. Go ahead.
I am here tonight to tell you about a father who loved his son and a son who loved his dad. The way this story is going to unfold for you is a little bit different because I want to bring it to now. You see, a dad would go home, and he would go by the school, and every now and then he would pick up his son and say, son, why don't you go to work with me? The boy loved that. And when his dad would just come and pick him up, he was the happiest boy ever. He knew that he would get to spend the afternoon with his father at work, and, and he would get his coat, and, and they would walk, and he, he would bring hot chocolate for his son for his really cold, and they would, they would go through. But this boy was different. This boy would see things. This boy wasn't normal, and when, he, when they were walking, one afternoon going to where dad worked, this boy would notice things that other people wouldn't notice. He'd see things other people wouldn't see. He sees a man in a bathrobe in the middle of the street who's yelling at a second story window. He sees a woman who's very angry at him and doesn't really want to hear what he says. This boy, as the rest of the world hustles by, he slows down. He sees the hurt and the pain. He sees the anguish and the sorrow. He sees the window close and a desperate man trying to get a what he did doesn't matter. That he hurting is all that matters. And this boy would see these things. His father rushes and gets him by the hand and says, let's go, be late. He would stop and look one more time. Can I stop his pain? Can I stop her hurt? But the boy loved his father. They would go and they would catch the, the trolley. I think that's what you call it here. We call it a tram. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the words. But he would get on there with his dad. And the boy would just notice people. He would look. And that day, one particular, he noticed uh, something as he got on the train. He to explain something. As you can hear, there's a train coming. And I got to get through this before the train gets here. He saw a man. He saw a woman. He saw that the man seemed very happy and the woman seemed very sad. And he couldn't understand why they could be together and one be happy and the other be sad. He couldn't understand that. But the little boy knew that there was something wrong. He had this feeling this instinct that was amazing how he cared for other people but he loved none other than his father he knew his daddy loved him and as he watched the world and their hurt and their pain he knew that he would always have a father but he even noticed this I need you to understand as you hear this story and get involved in the life of this man and his son I need you to notice that there's no mom As they walked through the woods, the boy would say to his father, Dad, what will I do when I grow up? What will I get to do? Will I get a cool job like yours? How will I work? He says, I don't know, but I want to change the world. I want to do something great. I want to do something wonderful. I want to help people. I want to do something that, that can change the lives of anyone. I just want to be that great. I just want to do something good. And as he walked with his dad, his dad would say, Son, you will be great. You will be awesome. You will change the world. Your life is going to be incredible. There was a train coming. There's always a train coming. The train is called life. We're all on the train of life. Just riding. Whether we realize the truth or not, whether we realize what's happening or not, we're all on that same train tonight. Only God has saw it fit for us to be in the same room, in the same car, for such a time as this. When they get to the edge of the train track, he can see where his father worked. You see the bridge? That's what his dad did. You see, the bridge was very, very important. Boats needed to come to the harbor to get off their goods so they could make money. But trains were coming with people going from one town to the next. Not many cars in Europe, so they couldn't use a lot of that. So many people, not enough roads, so everybody used that train to get from the town to town to get to work and to get home. And one day the train was coming by. What you have to understand is that boy loved going to work with his dad. He would stay right by the river's edge and he would do what he loved to do the most. Let me explain that. He loved to fish. Anybody like to fish here? Oh, all the guys go, uh, uh. The dad looks at his boy and he says, son, now remember the rules. You got to stay right here because I can see you from the window right here. Don't get out of the sight of this window because you got to stay there so I know you're safe. Catch you something good to eat. But as you can hear, the train's coming. The father's job was cool. 
I wasn't a preacher, I wouldn't mind doing that. Get to work. Get grease on you. Even if you didn't have to, you just squirt it on you like you feel like you did something. That's what I would do. <laughs> there was a boat coming in the harbor. Timing is very essential. I'll go ahead and give you the key. The key is this. There's always a light. Everybody say light. Say it again. One more time. There's a light that the train conductor needs to see. If that light is green, he can go. If it's red, he must stop. You see, God has given us road signs in our life that we must read. Lines that tell us to go and lines that tell us to stop. Whether we read those and believe them or not is up to us. That's why some of you have fallen and you cannot get up. But tonight, that's why I'm here. The boat needed to come through, so he called, and the man said, okay, I got time. It's a long time before the train should come. So he pulls the lever, as you just saw, and the big, big, huge stone steel bridge, the gears started turning. They started cranking the steam. All of a sudden, gears are moving, and that big, huge bridge is just starting to go up. As it rises higher and higher, he has to watch and make sure everything's set, everything's good, everything's fine. As he looks out the window, he can see everything, but the dad, being a good dad, keeps one eye on his work but the other eye on his baby one eye on the world but the other eye on his children you think God doesn't know where you are he keeps one eye on his world and one eye on his child no matter what you've done or where you've been it's one eye on the world but the other eyes on you he's watched you and he's kept you even though your train is coming down the track he understands that and even though sometimes I don't know I want to get ahead of myself see the red light he didn't see it. So many times we don't see the red light. See, to just say, the train was early. The boy can hear and see the steam. And he looks and says, Daddy, the train. Daddy, Daddy, the train's early. Daddy, you got a daddy. Hey, Daddy, 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 the train. Daddy, the train's coming. But the dad was looking at the gears, making sure he had enough oil, making sure there was enough steam to get the bridge back down for the train. And the boy, the boy knew one thing. Now listen, the boy knew that his dad one time showed him where the trigger was. It was a red lever. If he pulls it, the train bridge would collapse down fast and the train would be able to come across. All the boy knew was there were people on that train. There were people that needed to be saved. There were people that had, some of them just with their friends having a good time. Like everything's fine. They did not know that the bridge was up. They did not know what was coming. They're just living their life like you and me. Just going down the road. Just being our own thing. Doing our own thing. And the dad all of a sudden hears the train coming. He looks and then he says, oh my son. He looks out and his boy Boy's gone. He's like, oh my God, where's my son? Where's my son? He got to figure out. He looks back just in time to see his son trying to save the day. All he had to do was pull that lever. He reaches in to pull it, and the boy pulls too far, and he falls in the hole. Now it's on the father, and God the father. Did you hear me? God the father has to make a choice. It's his now. Do I save my son, or do I save the world? But they don't even know. They don't even know. The greatest decision of his life. He can blame it on them not seeing the red light. He can blame it doesn't matter anymore. Pull the lever, save the world. Leave it up, save your son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whosoever leaves in him three two one he's home and they didn't even know they never would know they didn't even know the train goes by it's fine everything's cool the bridge is down just like always it's always going to be down are you hearing me tonight? He gave his only son. For God so loved the world that he gave. And you know what's amazing? I wonder what God did right when his son died on that cross. When he breathed his last breath. When he took that breath and he breathed and it was over. Here's 
what your father would have looked like. They didn't even know, just trying to think of their life, just trying to figure out what they're going to do next. Just thinking about the person they're going to see, the people they're going to hang out with. Just trying to be, just loving, caring. Doesn't matter if you're blind. Doesn't matter if you're putting on a little more makeup, trying to look pretty for somebody, or just wearing another mask. It doesn't matter. God gave his son for you. What will I do when I grow up? Where will I go when I grow up? Oh, we got to change. And there was a girl in the bathroom on the train, liquefying her heroin to shoot up one more time. He died for her. He died for her. But in one moment, are you listening? In one moment, as the Bible says, everybody gets a chance. In one moment, to see the look of the Father when He knows what He, when you realize what He did for you, when you realize the sacrifice, when you realize He let His Son die so that can live when you realize what he did no matter what you're doing no matter where you're at in this life no matter what you're a part of you gotta stop you gotta stop even if it's for one second and think my god he did it for me he did it for me and I pray to God you drop what you're doing you do it with all the pain and the hurt and the sorrow in the world he did it for you that's why you're so quiet you see the train's coming the train's coming Everybody has things, you have ways of, of I don't want to hurt it. I don't want to do that. I don't want to, but why do I keep doing it? Even Paul said, why do I do what my flesh tells me and I do what I know is wrong and I don't do what I know is right. You got to understand tonight, the fight is on and we can win. We become more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And I'm not preaching just for me, I'm preaching on behalf of you. But what you got to understand is there had to be a moment in those three days when Jesus died on a Friday and rose again on a Sunday there had to be this moment go ahead look at the screen when it was just God and his baby and his son every sin that's ever been committed in this world is rolling through your mind right now I'm here to tell you that as the sun sets in the afternoon, the sun will rise again. And when the sun rises again, you cannot change your past, but you can change your future. You see, it's always a different day. One day someone lives, the next day they die, the next day you wake up and you're still living. You're like, why am I going to live? Why does this have to be my turn? Why can't I? You can just preach. I can't stop, but I need you to see the whole picture here. You see, because when God the Father gave his only son, when Jesus Christ breathed his last breath and he died, he did it in a way that you can never ever say, you don't know me, you don't understand me, God don't understand my pain, God don't understand my sorrow. You see, that's the very train that was that boy was on. That's the very train that he was on. And as this dad remembers, look real close. You see the pictures of the people? Bam, there they are. But there's somebody added in the picture, isn't it? Bam, there they are. Do you see who's added in it? In every face of every person. Person, Jesus is in their life. Why? Because when you're the greatest sacrifice, you always end up in everyone's life. No matter where they are, who they are, he did it so that you can say he was there all the time. Waiting patiently in line. Jesus Christ was there all the time. And the train keeps going. The train keeps coming. Train keeps moving. People keep living and people keep dying. And God the Father just watches it all. One eye on the world, the other eye on you. Some of you are starting to figure it out. You're like, what is he looking for? Just one girl. 
Because see, the whole horrible day, God only had his eyes on one person. And it was just a day on the street corner. When he walked by, he saw a girl with a babe. And she saw him. Do you get it? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. He did it so that we could live. No matter what the sin, no matter what the pain, no matter what the sorrow, the sacrifice was perfect. It was And it was for you. And God the Father watches it all unfold. And all he can say is one word. Everything. God did it for love. You know, we can think of the sacrifice of Christ and, and disconnect from us, but when you see it in a modern setting, you can grasp hold of the love of the Father. And when you read that verse that his one and only son, you know, we are children of God. Jesus is the one and only in the sense that he was one of a kind. The one of the kind son of God died so that you could have life. It doesn't matter the sin that you've been in. It doesn't matter the pain that you've experienced. It doesn't matter the sorrow that you've had in your life. The sacrifice of Jesus was perfect, and it was for you. And the question is, have you received that today? Have you accepted that loving sacrifice into your life? Those two verses, John 3, 16 and 17, for this is the way God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. That's what he did for you. Amen. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Father God, thank you for the love that you have for us, that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to pay the price for our sin that his sacrifice is sufficient to cover us, and we thank you for that today. And Lord, as we've seen in this short video, the love of a father for a son, yet love for humanity more that he would sacrifice his son to save the world. Lord, let us receive that love today. Let us realize and grasp how much love you have for us and live differently. God, I pray that you would give us a glimpse of you that would transform our future. We thank you, Lord, that in you, the old is gone and the new has come and we're made new creations when we accept you and live for you. Help us today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.